Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Set Lusting Bruce, your podcast all about Bruce Springsteen, his music, and mostly his fans. And while Bruce is our ma- probably one of our main topics, we are going to be talking about the Antarctic and suffrages. And I don't know if we will get on Taiwan sad songs again like we did last time, but we <laughs> might. Ishan is back. The last time she was here was the episode was published on August 17th, 2021. I looked it up. Welcome awesome. back, my friend. Jesse, it is such a pleasure to be here. It's so wonderful to see your face. It's so wonderful to hear your voice. I can't wait to have another robust conversation with you. What a joy to be back. Yeah. So for those of you who may not have heard the episode, listen to this one first, but then go back and I will include the link. But we had a great discussion, and I shared at the episode then, where Ishan had written this really powerful opinion piece about her complicated relationship with Born in the USA as a Springsteen fan, but as a someone who was treated a little shabby by some people, as someone who looks different, the standard wasp things, and we had a great discussion last time so i'm looking forward to this time welcome back and how's things going they're great you actually are catching me away from my home in california i am in seattle doing some book events so it's a good time for us to catch up and you are catching me in the middle of four events i've done two out of four events i'm just praying my voice holds out you are i guess you count as a fifth event right so yes (laughs) i guess so yeah yeah we're going to talk about bruce but First off, tell someone who had not heard the other podcast a little bit about yourself. Yeah, thank you. So I am a writer. I'm currently a novelist, although, of course, rewriters are always working on shorter projects inside and out. I live in Southern California, and I've written, let's see, two novels now and a memoir. And I'm always just interested in the intersection of pop culture and in our lives. I'm particularly interested in how those of us who are immigrants end up responding or integrating with things like Americana, right? In my case, it's the Old West and Bruce Springsteen and bicycles and the great outdoors. So all of these things play a part in my in my work. And I'm just really happy that I finally sorted out that whole Bruce Springsteen thing because it was really ripping a hole in my guts, I'll tell you what. <laughs> So you just saw a show. So talk to me a little bit. Which show did you see? And tell me what your thoughts were. Oh my gosh. How much time do we have? As Uh, long as you want. (laughs) We went to the Las Vegas show. We live in Southern California. The drive out to LA just like kills us every single time from where we live. It's not nice to go out to Inglewood because the traffic is always bad. And then getting out of the stadium is really terrible. So my husband found these tickets for us for the Las Vegas show after Bruce had his terrible intestinal issue. He had to reschedule a bunch of shows and we were just very lucky to be able to get tickets to Las Vegas. we You will know by now that I have an obsession with, with the desert. So we like Las Vegas, but we also love Death Valley, which isn't too far from there. We got married in Death Valley. And we just thought we'd take it as an opportunity to just go back and visit all those great things. My husband, Jim, had never seen a Bruce Springsteen show. And this would only be my second. Bruce is 74 now, so it was time to catch up with him. Since I've been back from that show... I have done nothing but hunt down my friends who are also going to Bruce shows and just talk to them about what to expect and how they're going to love it. And I'm trying to like text them the day after they get back from the show to be like, oh my gosh, what did you think? Let's reminisce. Let's talk about it. And I'll tell you what, he didn't play Born in the USA this time, which is, is a is a song that is fraught for me. But do you know what? I felt more part of a family than I ever have in any large venue going to this show. It was like, well, first of all, Bruce plays like he owes it to somebody right? You know that you're about to go see your 20th show, right? And that in and of itself is utterly just transporting. But you watch the way the crowd interacts with him and how it's not that they have his back. It's that they're with him all the way through. They know every word to every song. I sat next to a couple with pretty heavy Italian accents, I think, and they were on it. Every single song, they were like, they were belting it out. And then I had a really good view of the sound guy or the, sorry, the, the lighting guy, right? Yeah. They're playing with all the toggles and they're up and down. And every single time they were out there, they were hip thrusting the board. They're just like in it and just playing with it. And it oh God, it was just, it, it's so much joy, Jesse. I just, I don't know how to 
recreate that anywhere else. It's remarkable. So, so I, I love hearing this story for a couple of reasons. One, God love them, but there are a few fans that have gone to, I, I don't think you can ever go to too many Springsteen shows, but they have reached the point where there's almost this, it was nothing special, right? Oh my and, gosh. <laughs> and, um, or there was a lot of controversy last year because he was not changing up the set list very much. Okay. Um, and now then there's this, oh, he's doing it better. It's, it's, he's staring. I do think that after his health scare and he has been very open about, he was worried he would never sing again. Wow. That because he says it's the diaphragm. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's where voice comes. And what if I can't sing? So I think he is feeling healthy. I think he's excited. And, and I talk to people, yeah. right. Yeah, that I say, Yes, this may be your 20th show. This may be your 50th show. But there's somewhere out there, a lot of people, this is their first show. Right. Or their second show. Yeah. And don't put a wet blanket on their enthusiasm, correct? Yeah, there's that. But also, why are you putting a wet blanket on your own enthusiasm? There's something different in every show. We love live music because there's something different in every show. And if you've been privileged enough to go to... 50 shows, 35 shows, 20 shows, you owe it to yourself to find something that is going to make you joyful in that show. If you can't yeah. find it on stage, then look around at the audience because there's somebody out there who is rocking their head off or just like sitting there with their jaw on the floor because Max is wailing away at the drums for three hours on end, right? Yeah. Or look for the minute things that are going to bring you joy because they're there. They're there and not every show is the same, right? It, it Exactly. I had a guy on from the UK and he said the set list is like the final s score of a football match. He said it may be 3-2, but that doesn't tell you anything that happened, oh, right? That. And I thought that was a really good analogy, yeah. right? Because of how it goes. So yeah. that's wonderful. Any... I, I am. He doesn't always do Born in the USA. He does it a little more for European office, sure, some reason. But were there a couple highlights of songs that you especially went, oh, man, I just can't believe I'm getting this? Yeah, okay. So every time he plays the favorites, I'm a little overclamped, right? Because there are musicians out there who refuse to play anything but from their right. most recent catalog, right? So I, I said earlier that he plays like he owes it to somebody. And I think that he really feels like he owes it to us. And that is so every single time there's a part of me that thinks, oh my gosh, he's a legend. Is he going to play the old tunes? Is he going to play the ones I love? Is he going to play Thunder Road? Is he going to play Born to Run? Is he going to play Racing in the Streets? Okay. And he did all of those, but he also did Last Man Standing, which is a newer one, but which is a tune I really love. I really love that one. So yeah, before we left, I, I did a lot of kind of brushing up on Asbury Park, which is just an album that I really adore. I don't know why. I think it just has to do with the fact that you're getting... Bruce at his most in love with words. You're getting yes. Bruce at the time when he's discovering his songwriting chops and he's just really enjoying himself. And I love listening to all of those as well. So yeah, we got a lot of we got a lot of really great tunes, but I'm just thrilled that I got to hear Last Man Standing Live. That was really great. One of my other podcast projects is Sylvan Groth and I are going through every John Hyatt song in alphabetic order. And we just did a song, Full Moon, which was off John's first album, Hanging Around the Observatory. And Sylvan is a massive Hyatt fan. That's how we got to be friends. And she talked about it that she goes, nowadays, I will stand that I think John is as strong a songwriter as Bruce is. Cool. But when you compare Greetings from Ashbury Park right. to Hanging at the Album Story, she's, there's just no, like, how can your first album be that good? <laughs> and he knew his voice almost from the beginning. Yeah. And go ahead. I think that's really interesting because we just watched that wonderful documentary about the making of We Are the World. Yeah. Oh, you know, great and, documentary. Oh my gosh, it's so good. It's so good. And listening to way, to the way they, the musicians all around him, Lionel Richie and Michael Jackson, knew what Bruce was going to be able to do. They did the, yeah. even the big meaty fillers because they knew, right? right? And there are very few songwriters and performers who are at that age who know what they can do, right? Pivoting to another musician, Charlie Puth, 
is just fantastic at that, right? Like he knows he's a genius at songs. He knows he's really good at putting at putting like yeah. sounds together. Yeah. And I just think it's really cool that that there are musicians out there who are that young who can like really take ownership yeah. of their talents and know them right away. The other thought I, I was interesting to me is this when that documentary about Letter to You, he tells the story that John Hammond said somebody told John if he's not careful, he's going to run out of letters in the alphabet or words in the dictionary, something like that was Bob Dylan. Yeah, I got lucky. He did. He did. If I was the priest in Houston and he did it, if it was in Austin and my wife was looking at, it was, it was, I, we went some friends that we all love. And so Jeff, Nancy, and I were just screaming and, and, and Linda's looking like, why are you so excited? It was like, yeah, yeah. I talked to me about how did you feel? One of the highlights of me and partly of this is I lost my brother on February 13th last oh, year. Sorry. God. And yeah, it, and it was so when I went to the show on February 10th, I knew that my brother didn't have long to live. And then on the February 4th, he had been, he had gone and I'll see you in my dreams really hit pretty personal to me. So any thoughts on, I, I think a couple of people have mentioned, and I think it's a, I disagree with them, but I understand that goes, it seems like a downer way to send you out of the stadium. And I'm like, okay, I, I see that point of view, but instead I see it as almost a benediction of as I send you out, remember yeah. that life is fragile and to be careful and to be, to treat it precious. Yeah, I think that was a theme throughout the entire show, actually, especially given the fact that like Phoenix was his first show back and that was the show right before Las Vegas. I love the idea of the benediction, Jesse, because I didn't think about it that way. I thought about it as a reminder that even though we all are parting for the night and probably for the rest of our lives, we're probably never going to see the people we sat next to ever again. We may not get to see Bruce ever again in terms of depending on whether or not we get to see another concert. I took it as a reminder that his music will always be with us in some way, yeah. right? He's, he's leaving in some ways a legacy for us. In my case, it was particularly poignant because maybe not related to the actual topic of the song, but my husband is a big metal fan. He went to see Metallica twice by himself. He saw a tool by himself recently. There are a couple of other bands that are on his bucket list. He loves that kind of music and I don't necessarily love it. So when we find music that we can meet on a moment, I've used this word before and we're going to use it as nauseam, but nauseam, but there's a moment of transcendental joy where we get to meet on that front. And so at the end of the day, I almost saw it as a, we're always going to have Bruce Springsteen no matter what. Like we will always have had this experience. And he told me later, he said one of the greatest parts of the evening for him was watching me enjoy Bruce Springsteen. So when he says, I'll see you in my dreams, for me, it's more of a promise that whatever it is he's gifted us with that night will go on and it will continue to, okay, bless us, right? To use your, to your, to use your terminology for so many years. And I think that's a really hopeful thing to send you out with, isn't it? Yeah, I think so too. That's interesting. I was going to ask you what your husband thought. So sounds like he enjoyed it. Yeah, he, I told him, I'm like, oh boy, Jim, now we have these tickets. We have to brush up on our Bruce Springsteen. And he looked at me and said, I know a lot more of the catalog than you think I do. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah, really? And that's the thing is he's a very different person than I am. Like we're, right. I'm, I'm what they call an, an, an extrovert. I think I tend to draw energy from other people. And I think he's more of the quieter sort of person, but it's so interesting that Bruce, if you grew up at all in the United States in the eighties, you were going to, you were going to know some of his catalog, but I was surprised to hear that Jim's favorite song of Bruce's is glory days. It seems like such an upbeat tune for somebody who loves tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? But yeah, it was it was a really cool experience for both of us for many different reasons. It's really great. Um, yeah, I I love that the the idea of him experimenting and seeing that's lovely because I have that that's one of the things that Linda and I are very different. She is much more like you, athletic and likes to go do a lot of stuff outdoors. And I just as happy sitting in a room without the windows open, just I'm happy. But we, when you find that connection 
that like, oh, I still like hanging out with you. I still doing this together is a really special moment. Yeah. 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 No, I, I love that. And I think I take it as a, a little bit of a reminder that these points of connection can come from anywhere, right? The most right. unexpected places, uh, you just have to be open to them. Yeah, I think absolutely. A, as I get older, I think I'm finding myself more and more challenged to make that happen because we know more and more about ourselves and we know more and more about the world in general. And so it's very hard to fight against the idea that like, oh, I already know it all. I don't need to, I don't need to explore anything else or anything new. I turned 50 this year, Jesse, right? We'll turn 50 in a couple of months here. And it's one of those things where it's, it is simultaneously refreshing to, to keep on reminding myself of that, but also really tiring <laughs> or it's, oh boy, here we go again. Something new that I don't quite know or don't quite understand. I'm going to use that as a bridge to read a lot. And I go through a lot of mysteries and I read science fiction and there'll be times when I go through a phase of reading popcorn, basically Hallmark movie books and everything. Uh -huh. But if someone said, yeah, I've got a book about a young teenage girl on an Antarctic exhibit, I'm like, I'll pass. I'm OK. Right. Right. I'm OK. Yeah. We're th thanks. I, I hope you enjoy it. Yeah. But. I adore your writing and I adore you. So I said, okay, I've got to get to it. And the name of the book is The Suffer's Guide to the Antarctic. And from the first two pages, I was captivated by this world. So and much. yeah, I, I, and I have mentioned to multiple friends who are big readers to say, I think this is something really interesting and entertaining to read. I'm going to go from fan, your mm -hmm. your fan hat to your author hat. Talk <laughs> about where the gem of this book came from. So I mentioned before that I'm turning 50 this year. When I was 27, I read The Endurance, which is the story of Ernest Shackleton's ill-fated expedition to Antarctica. He had done, I, I can't remember now, it was two or three expeditions before that, and he would go on to do one more after that. And the thing about this particular expedition is that it is well known as being the expedition that benefited from great leadership. This book, the book that I wrote, is very closely pegged to the Endurance Expedition. What happens is that the expedition ship gets crushed in ice, and then the people have to find their way back in some way, shape, or form. Shackleton did get all 28 men on the expedition back alive. But I didn't understand why the story captivated me so much until I started really examining what it means to be a leader and what it means to be able to galvanize an entire population of people to see your vision, right? In the first place, he had to raise money for this thing which meant galvanizing the general public. And in the second case, he had to find 28 men who would go with him for not great wages. And then in the third place, he had to get them all back alive and somehow somehow keep their morale up in some way, shape, or form. And at the beginning, I thought, wow, this man is a great leader. And then the more I looked at it, the more I realized that there was so much more to leadership than just that. And then, so that was, I don't know, my mid-30s or so. And then I started looking at the role of women in history. And as from the time that we've been talking, I've been obsessed with this idea for a really long time. And it just burned me up that there were women out there who were doing great outdoors things, but when they applied to go on expeditions like Ernest Shackleton's Endurance Expedition, they were just dismissed out of hand because they were women, right? And it was infuriating for me to think about that. So really the story is born out of fury and anger and frustration. And that's it turns out that's not a bad way to write a book. <laughs> Turns right. out it's a pretty good way to write a book. But I learned a lot about, about leadership and about, about the women's role. And the fact that she's a suffragist just happened to come in handy because at the time the expedition took place, there were two wars going on, right? 1914 was the beginning of the of World War for England. That was the, the day that the Endurance set off on their expedition was the same day that England entered into World War I. And it was also the exact time of, of the 1910s that the fight for women's suffrage was was like ramping up and really going on. So there are these two wars going on, one civil, one not. Um, and I just thought, well, what's happens? what happens if we mash these two things together, right? What happens if we put them together? Um, and at the end of the day, that's what happened with this book. So yeah, I was fascinated. I, I told you before we hit record 
that as I'm reading this, and I am struck by that specifically women, but all of us to a certain degree, have to hide who we are. So if you can't be, and that's that great scene at the end of Barbie, right? Where mm -hmm. she says, I got you, I have to be confident, but I can't be over. I can't be cocky. Yeah. I have yeah. to be empathetic, but I have to be strong, yeah. right? I, I have to show, but if I push too much, I'm arrogant. And your, your hero, heroine, is actually an 18-year-old American, but she's lying and she's 21-year-old Canadian. And she has to keep, she yeah. can do things that the crew yeah. 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 needs done better than they can do it, but they don't even want to give her a chance. Exactly, exactly. And I, I'm so glad you brought up that hiding bit, okay? Because the, a number of people, when I describe this book to them, they say, oh, does she do the thing where she dresses up as a man to, to get on board? And I said, no, I, not that I'm offended by that storyline. I, right. I think it's a fine storyline. And it, it did happen in history. There were plenty of women who had to sure. you know, get by binding themselves and cutting their hair short and pitching their voices a little bit lower. But I really wanted the crew of the Resolute, which is my expedition ship, to have to contend immediately with the fact that there was a woman on board. And the other thing that this device does is it, it pitches the expedition leader in a way that I think is true to Ernest Shackleton's kind of like spirit, right? He, if only he could see past the whole male-female thing, but he was an expedition leader that insisted that everybody on board the ship did the exact same tasks in an era where, you know, that whole like hierarchy system in England was very much intact. It, it's still intact today. But right. at that point in time, and specifically in other Antarctic expeditions, there were expeditions where they were in really dire straits, but the expedition leader still insisted on separating one class from the other, right? And Shackleton was not about that. He was not interested in that kind of thing. Oh, you're an enlisted Marine? Big freaking deal. You're going to scrub the desk along with everybody else, right? You're going to clean out the slop pail. You will scrub the dogs, kennels. You will do all these things because on the ship, everybody is equal. And I thought that this was one of those things where there was room on the crew for a woman. We could make this happen without stretching the bounds of reality too much, in part because of who Ernest Shackleton was, the inspiration for my crew captain, my, my crew boss, but also in part because I had read a lot of the crew diaries that was part of my research. And I got to go back and I, I read these diaries, some of them from the original source material, which was just an honor beyond all honors. It was amazing to be able to handle, handle these documents. But I believed that if these men just were not laboring under the presumption of so many things they didn't know, they would have likely made room for a woman on board if they'd been able to be presented with, with one. So yeah, that's that hiding part of it was just, it's I'm so done with it. <laughs> So done with it, Jesse. I have no time for it. I'm, I'm through with it. Through with it. What I also shared with you that it feels so outdated, yet timely, that it is this massive of a deal that we want women to vote. It yeah. just seems like, that. why? How is that even a thing? But then when you throw in that people getting access to marriage, yeah, not even something as controversial as uh, a woman's right to choose or reproductive health or these things, just simple of I love you and I want to marry you. And that is offending people. And as you mentioned, it's power. So right. expand to me what, how, when you're making this gumbo of a story, what did you, why did you want to bring that specific seasoning into it? Oh, it was, so part of it was time, right? As I mentioned to you before, it was yeah. just like, it was too close for me not to actually bring in the suffragist thing. So right. part of me that hues to history was going to be, it was not going to be able to write the story without that. But the other part of it is that the women, the things I describe in the book about the the British suffragists doing, learning jujitsu, making up letter bombs, cutting telegraph wires, the sense of desperation that these women were experiencing was very close to me to the type of thing that happens when you are thrust into a survival situation, right? These women were acting as desperately as they did, and they went to such lengthy measures because they were fighting for survival. 
in their world, whether it's Edwardian England or Antarctica, where like your very body is at risk, the stakes are super, super high. We were at a time at, at that point in time in England where decisions were being made for women left and right and not by women. And in, in many cases, that still is the case today, right? Sure. Thankfully, we, we have more women in, in, in government than we do now and we're more women at the head of government than we do now. But those women are still fighting to survive. So I think the overall theme of survival was just too much for me to not marry the two things. I wanted to make it very clear that getting the vote is a form of survival. If women hadn't gotten the vote, where would we be now? We would yeah. still be... We would still be dying because people who didn't understand our bodies were making terrible medical decisions. We would be locked up in sanatoriums because people didn't understand that when we are saying certain things or doing certain things, we're just expressing our humanity. Right. My friend Ken posted a couple of years ago, I wish I could find it and I wish I'd printed it out for this time, but he pointed out a, it was a poster from a, from an old sanatorium and it was a list of, re of reasons that women could be committed. And one of those reasons was novel reading if you were if you loved novels as a woman you could be committed you could be right. committed to the institution what is that that's just because you're like what are you afraid of and that's the kind of thing that i just i yeah i so yeah at the end of the day it came down to survival for me the fact that these two things were too, too closely related so i sent you a note in the middle of it when a certain event happens and i will not because I, it's, it is a one. So you are giggling, but I assume as Isaac Asimov told a story once that he wrote a story and he gave it to his daughter, Robin. And when she finished reading it, she was bawling. She, it was so sad, dad. And he says, as a father, I felt horrible, but as a writer, I was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to live that down. For those of you who are who are maybe are going to read, the thing happens on page 151, I want to say. So <laughs> I would maybe just keep an eye out for those pages. Yeah. And I felt also, from my perspective, a lot of the characters were actually kind and yeah. wanted to treat Clara as a equal in their mind and things that they gave her that we would go, gosh, that's incredibly condescending. They don't even see it that way. But you do have a couple of people that are jerks. And oh, I sure. think once again, that's very realistic of a picture. Yeah. Those jerks are drawn from real life. A lot of the crew members, and it may, it shouldn't surprise you by now, given that you're such an avid reader. The reality is that like fiction writers People always say, where does your inspiration come from? You're so imaginative. And I always tell them, no, I'm just a really good eavesdropper. Not just on other people, because that really good, we're, I, maybe the kinder way to say it, and probably the more accurate to say, way to say it, is that we're very good at observation, right? We're really yes. good at reading people, and we're really good at picking up on certain nuances and, and putting those down on paper for you, the reader, to discover for yourselves. But we're also really good at observing our own lives. Okay. And that whole, that, that old joke about how you better be nice to me. Otherwise I'm going to put you in my book. Okay. That's not a thing we look forward to. We don't want somebody who's so mean to us that we have to put them in our book in order to be able to excise that demon. Right. Yeah. And that actually tips me off to another point, right? This idea of like me putting you in my book because you did something mean isn't about revenge at yeah. all. It's about me writing through what you did to me. Yes. You no. Know? It's about me trying to process what happened to me when, when you did the thing you did. I'm not saying that everything that happens in the book happened to me, but I am saying that enough of it happened that I was able to extrapolate that. We've talked before about Lee Child and his incredibly like larger than life Jack Reacher books, right? Yeah. And somebody asked Lee Child one time, his, the man is like, Jack Reacher is an American military guy, right? He's really tall. He's six foot five with a 52 inch chest. Okay, he's gigantic, right? He knows a little bit about everything. He walks forever. He's larger than life. Somebody, Lee Child, was a television producer. He was never in the military. He doesn't know half the things that Jack Reacher knows, if, if right. even a third of those things, right? So somebody asked him, how is it that you can write kidnapping and violence so well, right? Like, 
you've never had anybody who's been lost to you and you don't know where they are. So how is it that you can write something like kidnapping so well? And he's, yeah, nobody's ever been kidnapped in my family, but I have lost my child in a grocery store once. So the craft of a writer or of any person who works in imagine or songwriters even, right? To go back to Bruce for a second, is to take the thing that's happened to you and just blow it up. What does it feel like? There's a section in the book where Clara talks about having to remove somebody's paw from her hand, from her leg while yeah. they're like in the Antarctic and, and it's ridiculous. That is the kind of thing that has happened to me and has to happen to me regularly. Okay. Sure. It is beyond absurd to be in, for instance, I, I think we, we talked about this last time I volunteer for a disaster relief organization and it is beyond absurd to be in a disaster relief situation and have somebody try to make the moves on you. Yeah. Right? Yo, dude, I'm focused on this thing over here. Okay. Yeah. You what are you thinking about? What, what is what is happening in your brain? Genuinely, that is thinking with your nether regions. Yes. Whereas I'm busy thinking with my brain. Okay, so I'm busy over here. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, it's just so interesting to me the way that, you know, the way that, I don't know, I, it's just, I st it still boggles my mind to this day. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I, we may have talked about this, we may have not, but Lawrence Block, one of my favorite writers, yeah. was, was at a book signing and I asked them a question about a character um knowing something and i said i think this character knows uh -huh. basically that her that her significant other is having an affair and he goes i think she might know it too as mm -hmm. in he didn't and it either and i don't feel like he was just being cute i think he yeah. really was i i think i know what the character knows but i'm not sure is there a character or is there something that surprised you as you were telling this journey? Yeah. I was surprised that Clara is as angry as her mother as she ends up being. That kind of came out of nowhere. I think in part, in part because my editor asked extremely personal questions. <laughs> Editors are, it's, it, it may surprise some of your listeners to know that what happens when you end up getting a publishing deal is that it then sits on your editor's desk and your editor looks through it and makes a bunch of revisions to it or asks you to make a bunch of, she asks very pointed, very probing questions. So there's a lot of revision that happens once you sell the book. And it's one of those things where, as you just pointed out, a new reader to your work is going to see something that you probably didn't see, right? And when I first turned this story in to my to my editor, Claire's relationship with her mother was hunky dory, fun. Like they would go camping together, yeah. blah blah blah, all these great things. And my editor was like, she, I can't even remember the question she asked me, but it just unlocked this whole dynamic of this relationship. And at the end of the day, it turns out that Clara was furious, furious at her mother because her mother wasn't taking up the mantle of suffrage in, in right. the way Clara thought she should. And I, that was, yeah, that was super surprising to me. Really surprising. Uh, maybe it shouldn't have been because from generation to generation, you're going to have that tension no matter what. But yeah, I did not know that it was going to go in that direction. Yeah. Once again, I just want to talk about how much I loved it. What's been the response? It's a little bit hard to tell. My books like mine are generally sold through library and school sales. Yeah. Uh, so it was picked up by something called the Junior Library Guild, which which is a wonderful device that helps librarians to discover great books. And that's been incredibly gratifying. I know that there's a wait list at, at the libraries for the audio version, which by the way, let me just pimp that for a second because the actor who does all these voices, Jade Wheeler, is an absolute miracle worker. We have something like five or six different accents going on in this mm -hmm. book. Yeah. She just nails them all. It was really weird to hear Clara, who has lived in my head for so long, suddenly articulated by somebody else. And she just nails it. She nails it. Wow. She does such a great job. Yeah. The audiobook has has holds on it all over the place. I think it's going to be pretty popular. We, we had... We had a couple of good events here in Seattle where there were old friends and new people that I didn't know who came out. When I say pretty popular... What I really want to happen is I want people who read it to come away with an expanded sense of possibility. I want young readers to know that even if they didn't think of Antarctica for themselves, what is their Antarctica? What's the thing that right. they never thought about before that is now possible to them? I want it to be a book that opens up worlds to people. I want people to get excited when they hear that it's a story about a, a girl who goes for an adventure in Antarctica. Because there aren't that many stories out there that star young, ballsy girl adventurers. And I want people to make more of those stories. 
I yeah. want more people to be writing more of those stories. I want my shelves to be full of stories that star young women who are off doing their thing yeah. and who are being brave about it. Yeah. One other kind of behind the scenes, was it because the diaries that you read, the journals so impactive, is that what kind of led you to using that form of storytelling? Oh, Jesse, I wish it was, I wish it was so pure and organic. <laughs> Here's what <laughs> Silly happened. Silly Jesse. Silly Jesse. So naive, so sweet, willing to believe the best of all of his guests. This is so embarrassing. Okay. So my, you, I, I have a little bit of a fear of being a one trick pony, right? Okay. Um, about, about some things, right? Like I, I'm not overly scared of banging the drum of women's rights over and over again. I'm not overly scared of telling the story of brave female adventures over and over again. But from a craftsperson point of view, I am very wary of the fact that my first novel was a diary novel. My second book was a memoir, which is more or less a long diary entry to myself, right? Okay, that's right. what memoirs are, right? You're just, you're noodling through all this stuff, right? Okay, so I was loathe for this book to be a diary book, really trying to stay away from it. So I went back and forth, first person, third person, first person, third person. And then I realized that Ernest Shackleton actually realized, I, I discovered that Ernest Shackleton actually sold all the publicity rights to this expedition before, by way of raising money before they left. And as part of that, what that means is that basically all the diaries would belong to the expedition. Like that's the way it was, right? So it just became organic. He made all of his men keep diaries or very heavily suggested it. So it just, as a device, it made sense that she would also have to keep a diary that she would also have to do this thing. Yeah, not so much of a straight line. And I resisted it. But at the end of the day, it made too much sense for me not to do it. Right? It, From my perspective, it helped me get into her head easily. And so, so it, 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 it was, um, the style was very easy to read. So yeah, I, I thought it worked well. Wonderful. Um, I'm glad to hear that. I'm glad to yeah. hear that what's printed is working because it's too late for me to take it back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so absolutely next book, not a diary format. Oh God. Never I'm say never. Right? No, I, I don't think I should jinx it. You know? Okay. I, so, so, so the way that it's working out right now, like I've written the first couple of chapters and it isn't a diary, but there are some letters interspersed here and there. Okay. So it is still some of the like dear blank things, sure. going on, but we'll see. I, yeah, I'm really hoping not. Cause I really, I want to stretch my wings a little bit. Sure. It isn't enough to, again, going back to Bruce, like you look at him reinventing himself album yeah. after album. And as a creative, I take a lot of inspiration from that. The man is 74 and he's still reinventing himself. He's still doing things like paying homage to a form that he's always loved. And and so I think that I can probably do that myself. I can probably do the same thing. I can do that. I can do that. So speaking of Bruce, and yeah. as we're recording this, it's officially announced they're going to, they're doing a movie based on the Warren Zane book, Delivery from Nowhere, The Make of Nebraska, The oh. Hollywood Reporter. Have you read the book? No, I haven't. I haven't. I, haven't I know you're busy, but it is, I, I would be curious to hear from your perspective as a writer and as a fan, your thoughts on it, because I really I will enjoyed definitely it. put on my reading list. Yeah I'm, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I, my, on my reading list right now, actually, I'm, I'm reading Carl Sagan's Cosmos because some friends who are getting married have asked me to officiate at the wedding, which is a huge honor, but they are massive Carl Sagan fans. And I am now in the midst of this massive book that is just blowing my brain. And it's, it's a very long book, Jesse. Yes. It's a very long book. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so I will have to wait until I'm done with Cosmos. Okay. But yes, I will, I will bump that up to the top of my list for sure. All right. Very nice. So I do what you do have something else in mind creatively. Yeah, I do. Thing? I have three books in mind. They all, again, I mean, with my one trick poniness, they all have to deal with women and our role in the world. One is uh, the most, the one that's like most fleshed out in my head right now is a story about a young woman whose older sister goes out West to work in a one-room schoolhouse, but they don't hear from her for some time. And then it turns out that she's been working in a brothel. 
yeah, they have to figure out not only is she working in a brothel, but she dies in a brothel fire. So we need to, my heroine has to go out West and find out what happened to her sister. And that takes place in the old West, which is another desert that I absolutely love to pieces. We've talked about Death Valley before. Yeah. And that's, that's that, this is my way of bringing people with me to, to that region of the world. And then there's another book that I'm actively working on that is less well fleshed out, but essentially it is, it leans a little bit on that wonderful middle grade book, Island of the Blue Dolphins. Do you remember that book? Oh, I am, I am now mad at myself, uh-huh. but I, cause I started to go when you said there's, they don't have books that have strong female leads. I'm like, right. last one I remember was Island of a Blue Dolphin. Right. I almost exactly. said that. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and this is the thing. It's like, it's so wonderful that we remember that book and that it has yeah. made such an impression on our lot. So yeah, they're getting, I do know that that book is actually based on a true story. Isn't that remarkable? Like, it I is mean, remarkable. Oh gosh. This now is- I want to go reread it. Oh, it's so great. It's so great. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that there are real problems with that book. Scott O'Dell yeah. being a white man who yeah. you know wrote the story. Island of the Blue Dolphins is the only existing fictionalization, novelization of, of, of what did they call her? The Lone Woman of San Nicolas Island. But she actually had a name. I mm-hmm. can't remember what they called her. Anyways, it wasn't whatever. It wasn't her original name. Okay. Yeah. So it, it's the only novelization that exists to this day. That was written in 1960, right? It's the only wow. novelization of that book that exists to this, of that story that exists to this day. I'm not... There, there are definite problems with it. If you look at and read some of the Native American criticism of it, it, a lot of it makes a lot of sense. But I'm not wanting to rehash that story. I'm wanting to, rehash isn't the right word, but you get my drift. I'm wanting to use it by way of inspiring a more modern tale, right? In which my heroine is obsessed with that book and does whatever she can to live up to Karana's legacy, right? Okay, we'll see how that goes. And I think there may even be some some of the, I may go back to exploring the Taiwanese part of myself in that as well. So it could be an interesting thing, yeah. Very nice, good. Thank you. Any final thoughts before I let you go? So when I hear that people who are unexpected are reading my book, I'm just beyond grateful. And I'm so happy to be here because our audiences are not audiences that would ordinarily mix. Although you would be alarmed at the number of writer friends I have who are now due to report back to me about their Bruce Springsteen concert experiences. Leave it. It, It's an open invite. I love talking to writers. I love hearing people their first Bruce. So you just tell them, yeah, you just think I'm bugging you. Wait, I have to get you on this. Yeah. I was going to, I was going to ask you if it was okay if I pointed them in your direction. So I I would love to have them on. Yeah. So yeah, I think my final thoughts are that, are that I'm, I'm so grateful when any, but whenever anybody reads a book, that's a little bit outside of their wheelhouse. And I'm so grateful for just readers in general. But I also think it's really awesome that we're in a world where we can meet and be friendly and and adore each other's works without ever having met each other in person. I just think that's so freaking cool. It is, as I shared, I'm going to Columbus in a couple of weekends, and there's probably a half dozen people that I know via Twitter, aka X, or yeah. Facebook, or through Springsteen fandom that are like, I hope to see you. And so I'm actually hoping to figure out some day of the show. It's okay. I'm going to be blank here and try to get to meet people. So yeah. Pictures if that happens. I, I will. It. And it's, there's always this weirdness. I've been lucky enough to meet Brad Meltzer like seven or eight times at a book signing. And he's been very kind to me on social media when I was diagnosed with colon cancer, he sent a message. Are you okay? It's hard to say somebody you only meet once a year at a book signing is a friend, but you feel that connection. My first thought was my friend, Yishan has a new book. We've got to get her on. Yeah, that's it. We've only talked socially on social media, but we've only had the one conversation, but I feel the same way. I, I feel just incredibly proud of you and proud that this is I think it's a different kind of book. I think it's a great novel. I remember once, and I'm drawing a blank on the author, but he said, forget this being a good young adult novel. This is just a good novel. Oh, I love that. And so I, I, and so, yeah, forget this being a strong young adult novel. This is just a good novel and it's a good story. And I'm really really glad. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for having me on. I have, if it's okay, one question for you. Sure. 
what is your favorite Bruce Springsteen themed t-shirt? Great share. So what's funny is I do, I did have a buddy of mine made a Mary question t-shirt that uh -huh. has the car and says, yeah. the question isn't if it sways or waves, it's does she get in the car? Yeah. I love anything to do with Land of Hope and Dreams uh -huh. or Thunder Road, everything. It, it would be hard to tell. Now, what I think was funny is as we're recording this past weekend was WrestleMania. Uh -huh. And my adult son is currently living with us. He's saving up money to buy a house. And so he, much like on a cowboy game where he will put cowboy t-shirts all over to decorate, he had wrestling t-shirts everywhere. <laughs> and I said, what do we think? Do you have more wrestling shirts or do I have more Springsteen t-shirts? So yeah, like I'm wearing, have a little faith. There's magic in the night. So yeah. 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 So that's hard to answer. Okay. Hard to answer. Right. Yeah. I saw a t-shirt at the concert that I absolutely fell in love with and it was so simple. And I, I think I'm gonna have to buy one. It just says, I heart Bruce on it. And it just is, the sentiment is so pure and yeah. so fantastic. And that's all you really need to say. Yes, all you need to say. <laughs> absolutely. Yes, that is great. All right, listeners, the book, A Suffrage Guide to the Antarctic. I will include a link to it. You can find it wherever you find books. And I really would take it as a personal favor pick up a copy, go to your library, request it. That helps as well. And, and if you do read it, go and give a rating on Goodreads and Amazon because it really does make a difference. And it, podcasting is a lonely business, but at least I get to talk to someone. Re writing is a very lonely business. And so I know any review you get just means the world. Absolutely. We love hearing from readers. We absolutely do. So yeah, when you've read it, get back to me. Let me know what you think. I would love yeah. to hear. Speaking of that's perfect. How, if someone wants to reach you, how can they? I'm at Good Dirt on, what are we calling it now? I'm just calling it the accursed site these days because yes, they're really exactly. kind of making me bananas. Um, right. So I'm, I'm on Twitter at Good Dirt. I'm on Instagram at Ishan Lai. And those are the two places you really can find me. So yeah, please find me. And Jesse will include links. And I look forward to seeing you all there. That sounds good. All right. Listeners, go check out the book. Go listen to our previous podcast. We got all into her background and how she found Bruce and how much it means to you and support support good writing. And so for now, be kind, be safe. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye.